do you remember the scene in the movie Hulk? Send in the tanks. And we were like, whoa, what? And then we go, whoa, did he just cut a tank in two pieces? This makes us think that this giant beast, talking about the tank here by the way, not the Hulk, with thick armor is also penetrable. But if penetrating this tank is possible, what does it take to protect these heavy tanks on the field? This makes us wonder if maintaining, transporting and using and safeguarding these tanks are so difficult, then why do we need to have them? Oh, those are some serious questions, so let's get some answers, shall we? But before we start with today's question answers, if the same questions crossed your mind earlier, then we are alike. How about you click on that subscribe button and find some long needed answers? We are all so intrigued when it comes to watching a war movie like Dunkirk. We love how they strategize, their team coordination, the big guns, and of course, the entry of bigger tanks. We see the tanks destroying everything with no guns working on it, and all of a sudden, the protagonist comes up with this massive gun, and with one shot, our tank is upside down and on fire. Then what do you think is done to protect these tanks? Let's begin with knowing a little bit more about the tank structure and its history. Have a look at the basic construction of a tank. For reference, let's look at the M1A2 Abrams tank. P.S. Most tanks have similar sizes and shapes and other components. The Abrams tank is 12 feet wide and 32 feet long, with a height of 8 feet. It weighs around 68 tons, equivalent to 35 to 36 cars. The tanks contain 7 wheels on each side. The body is called the hull, and the dome-shaped thing on the top, which can rotate, is called the turret. The tank's engine is at the rear end. A general tank can contain about four people, three in the turret and one up front. Now, if you're a keen observer, you must have noticed that I haven't spoke about the rubber pads that are present around the wheels. These are called caterpillar tracks, made of steel and covered with rubber pads. This is highly important as the ground on which the tank will be used is not always straightforward. Let's talk about the engine at the rear end. The entire machine can be taken out during repairs. Moreover, tanks can run on any fuel, but most of the time, it's jet fuel. Like piston engines in the car, a tank has a turbine engine. Why the difference? Well, you see, the turbine engine is a lot more quiet than the piston and hence keeps the secrecy of the tank's position. Other features do include a phone on the inside of the tank to communicate with soldiers on the outside, two cooling units to cool down the hot engine, and side skirts or armored plates to protect the caterpillar tracks and wheels. The tank turret can rotate in a fraction of 9 seconds, and so can the main gun. The main gun can stay locked on target even when the tank moves on rough roads. To assist the main gun, there's a smaller coaxial machine gun on the side, another machine gun on the top, and smoke grenade launchers on the side, which are very conspicuous. The three crew members in the turret include the gunner, the loader, and the commander. This way, the commander has viewing ports for a 360 degree view. I know you all imagined the task with your little innovations. Impressive. But with so many facilities in and on the tanks, heavily armored skin, main guns and machine guns and secret weapons, is the tank penetrable? What weapon are tanks scared of? Let's get into depth of this. The need to defeat the tanks. During World War II, every fighting nation had come up with some version of tank having more facilities and weapons, more destructible, and so on. But what was needed was something that could defeat this tank. And so, the Russian mines worked on developing the RPG-43, a handheld anti-tank grenade. This grenade worked quite well actually and pierced through the thick steel armor of the tank, literally. But the problem with this grenade is that it was heavy and to work its magic, it had to be thrown whilst close to the tank, which is a big no-no. So. The Soviets worked more and gave the world RPG-7, a hybrid of American Bazooka and German Panzerfaust. RPG-7 is now used worldwide as an anti-tank grenade that can be launched far away. So, what makes this anti-tank grenade different from a normal grenade? What's a grenade? Well, in its simplest form, a grenade works on the principle of firecrackers. There's explosive stuff inside the shell, which, when ignited, when the pin is removed, the contents inside the shell are activated, and, well, we know the impact. But the normal grenades are not that effective on these gigantic tanks. A regular grenade is an explosive wrapped in a metal shell. When the explosion takes place, the metal is shattered into pieces, extremely injuring the ones nearby. 
but doing the same to a heavily armored tank is not possible for a normal grenade, and that is why you need the RPG-7. There's something special about these RPGs, and if we tend to protect our tanks, we first need to know our enemy. But before we move on to that, why don't you click that subscribe button so that we can keep a closer eye on you? Just kidding. How about you keep a closer eye on us? What makes the RPG-7 special? The rocket-propelled grenade, or RPG, is a shoulder-fired missile weapon that launches rockets equipped with a warhead. RPGs are easy to handle, very often being carried by one soldier and are the only effective weapon against armored tanks, which are widely used in many countries. The warhead of the RPG consists of explosive material, but that is not the only part propelled out from the grenade. Along with the warhead, a sustainer motor, a booster, and fins are expelled when the trigger is pulled. The sustainer motor is the one that ignites the explosives and is responsible for inducing the grenade with a maximum velocity of 300 meters per second. The fins act as a rotator for the warhead. With all these components working together, a massive explosion takes place, tearing into the armored skin of the tank. You'd think RPG-7s are so old. Haven't we made stronger tanks that can sustain the blow? Well, we sure did, but so did the newer anti-tank weapons. If you update one thing, you need to update the other one. That's how balance is acquired. When the tank was upgraded with ERA, that is, Explosive Reactive Armor, to overcome the blow of an RPG-7, javelins came into the picture with more advanced technology, which left the tank in pieces with its two-blow mechanism. One blow to weaken the armor, and the other to deform the tank. What can be done? It is now a fact that the anti-tank weapons have outmastered the heavily armored tanks. We can't add more armor on the tank, nor can we add more weapons on it, because one blow and all the weapons are activated on the tank itself, creating a more massive explosion. So, what is the solution? When it seems that there are no solutions, we need to improvise, and that is what should be done on modern tanks. Maybe we can't counter an attack from anti-tank weapons like the RPG-7, javelins, or nuclear weapons, but we can surely neutralize them. You're probably thinking to yourself, hasn't the defense intelligence already thought about this? Of course they have, but still, the active protection systems are not of use against anti-tank weapons such as the American Javelin and German PARS-3. The way they plunge on their target is highly destructive, even for tanks with ERA and active protection systems. So, the next question that arises, do we even need tanks anymore? A tank costs around 5 to 10 million dollars. This figure is without any active protection systems. If you consider adding those, then tanks costs 1 to 2 million more. Is this even worth it though, when a 2 million dollar javelin would attack the tank, shredding it into two pieces? Moreover, javelins or anti-tank grenades are easier to carry, user-friendly, with safety features for the soldier, and imparting the blow. If you consider tanks on the battlefield, their transportation and their speed compared to one of that of a Javelin or an RPG-7, it's clear that tanks really don't stand a chance. So now what? Is the age of tanks over? Do you think that tanks on the battlefield are a waste of money and are safer for the soldiers? Do you agree with tanks being outdated, or can they rise with new technology that could sustain them from attacks from anti-tank weapons? These questions need to be answered, but there is one more one more very important question that needs answering. Have you subscribed to our channel yet? I know you must have. Now come on, click on that bell icon too to get updates when we upload another interesting video. Thank you for joining, that was all for today's video, and we'll see you in the next one.